Welcome to Switzerland at Pier 17 in San Francisco to the panel discussion Wine and Tech. In normal times, we would have greeted you with a glass of Swiss wine and expressed a Swiss toast santé. This means health in French, one of our four national languages. Nowadays, the word health is probably one of the most important words. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to reframe this event online. I truly hope that you, your families and your friends are in good health and are adapting to the big challenges. It might come a bit as a surprise to you that the landlocked country Switzerland has chosen a place on the water for its representation in San Francisco. But in fact, the Swiss people had always ventured in uncharted territories. And wine and tech is a great example of that. The first wine association in the US was founded by the Swiss emigrant Jean-Jacques Dufour. He has also offered the first wine ever produced to the US, President Jefferson. Another famous Swiss emigrant, John Sutter, who stood at the beginning of the gold rush, has allegedly also grown the first wine in California. Next to the Swiss pioneering spirit, we have a second great virtue, perseverance. Dufour faced many failures, the wine association went bankrupt, and the biggest shortcoming was that he couldn't educate people to drink wine instead of whiskey. But he didn't give up, and his educative ambitions had a nevertheless a long-lasting impact. His book about wine growing is considered the Bible of American winemaking. Pioneering isn't just a souvenir of the past. Innovation is in the DNA of Switzerland and the US. When innovators from our two countries work together, you can really expect something extraordinary. Today, we bring three famous hotspots of quality and innovation together. Three valleys converge, the Silicon Valley, the Napa Valley, and the Swiss Drone Valley. Are you ready to come with us on a discovery tour? I'm really excited. Santé, cheers, and let's take off. Welcome to our webinar, Swiss Touch in Wine and Tech. I am Melisine Perrier, Project Manager in Cultural Affairs and Public Diplomacy at the Consulate General of Switzerland in San Francisco. The webinar you are about to watch was planned to be a live panel discussion here at Pier 17, but due to COVID-19, we made the decision to move it online so that you could watch it safe at home, whether you're in the Bay Area or not. For this panel discussion, we have selected four experts from the Swiss and American wine making and tech industries, and I would like to introduce them briefly to you before we start. From California, we first have René Schlatter, CEO of the Mary Real family of wine. René was born in Switzerland and currently lives in Napa Valley. As CEO, René has made significant contribution to Mary Real sales, marketing, finance, vineyard acquisition, and farming improvements. Today, he will present the business and management aspects of the wine industry and how he has been committed to protecting and preserving Napa Valley for future generations using sustainable practices. Also from California, we have Jean Hefliger. Born and raised in Switzerland, Jean is an all-rounder winemaker. He's worked in the vineyard in France, South Africa, Switzerland, and of course, California. Now a consulting winemaker, Jean's passion, knowledge, and scientific training allow him to bridge the past and the future of winemaking. From Switzerland, we welcome William Metz. Born in the United States, William moved to Switzerland to do research. Interested in using technology to improve wine quality, William founded Precision Wine and then joined in 2019 the product management organization of Gamaya, applying what he has learned in precision viticulture to other cropping systems. Gamaya is a Swiss digital agronomy company founded in 2015 as a spin off from the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne on a mission to tackle the global challenge from the pressing food scarcity under the motto, know your land. Also from Switzerland, we welcome Jean-Luc Helmiger, 
who works in the business development for Aero 41, a Swiss startup which brings together a team of experts in the field of flying robotics, aviation, and advanced application in the commercial civil drone sector. Aero 41 is the European pioneer in the development of drone dedicated to crop protection. And last but not least, the discussion will be moderated by Deva, Deva Guthmiller. Deva is the founder and chief creative officer at Noise 13, a branding and design agency that focuses on lifestyle brands. She has over 20 years of experience leading strategy and design projects with clients such as Uber, Twitter, World Wraps, and Paso Wine. She is also a board member of Slow Food California and an advisor for Good Food Awards. I would like to thank our partners for this event, Swiss Tourism, Swiss Next San Francisco, and all the Swiss representation of North America, starting with the embassy of, in Washington. I now wish you a pleasant viewing experience wherever you are. Deva, the floor is yours, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It looks like we still have, um, I love it. Just like all of you were all work, <laughs> trying to work from home. Um, so it looks like we might have a couple technical difficulties, but what better way to talk about wine and technology than on Zoom and um, getting help from anybody? Renee, all set over there? Yeah, can you guys see me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining me today. Um, so yeah, today we are talking about wine and technology and how those things are linked um, both now and looking into the future. Um, from drones that can spray our vines and monitor farm health, to smart sensors in decanters, uh, to virtual tastings. Technology is really changing what is in our wine glass and how we are enjoying it. Uh, a lot of tech that's being used to support wine growing is also supporting our food and food farming as well. And today our four panelists, I'm hoping, can really enlighten us on how we're using and creating technology to better the winemaking process both now and into the future. So since it is on um, the first time that a lot of people are meeting you guys, I do wanna get personal just for a second. So it would be really great to have each of you uh, say your name and share with us your favorite wine varietal and your favorite piece of technology, work or home. So I'll start at the top, John, how about you? I know that's a very hard question. I'm gonna say, what's your favorite wine varietal for this season right now, if you are gonna to have to drink something this afternoon? <laughs> well, yeah, it's, just, it's kind of unfortunately like a, a child, you know, uh, because yeah. I think that wine ultimately is a mood. And so you, depending on what mood you're in, you go pick a, a beautiful, you know, cold, crisp, acidic chasla or a big, bold, then California Napa Cab. So, so it really varies, you know, as, 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 as for me, as, as, as much as, as my moods, I guess. Uh, uh, um, and, and that's a big, big difference. As far as the technology is concerned, I think one of the greatest technology that I'm, I'm seeing is actually a smart bung. Is a, is a bung that you can put on barrels that actually analyzes uh, the, the chemistry of the wine live uh, and, and, and really helps reducing dramatically the risk of, of any microbiological deviants. Awesome. Uh, staying on the wine front, Renee, how about you? What is your current favorite wine bridal and your favorite piece of technology? Well, I have many actually, but <laughs> I would kind of echo uh, Jean or Jean's uh, answer there. I guess it depends a lot on the mood, um, but you know, obviously we're we're in Napa Valley, so uh, you know, cab is always a nice go-to. But I have to admit, these days I'm uh, actually on a on a lighter style, crisp, clean, um, you know, white varietals. So be it Sauvignon Blanc, or be it Petit Arvin, or Chasla, or uh, Albarino, uh, those kind of varietals uh, all, all fit the bill to me. So as long as it's good, it's great. <laughs> so. Uh, Otherwise, as far as a uh, piece of technology, so I'm not a winemaker per se, so um, I, I'd have to say, uh, maybe I'll, I'll veer to something else, uh, which is kind of quite common nowadays. Uh, obviously, <laughs> the phones that we have, the personal devices are quite uh, amazing, uh, if you will. It's, uh, 
it's a blessing and a curse, I, I guess, at the same time, because, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, so unbelievable. You can have everything at your fingertips in, the, in an instant, if you will. But then, uh, um, you know, I have a family, uh, uh, three, three kids. So <laughs> them being on the phone all the time uh, can be quite, um, uh, you know, frustrating, I think, for, uh, for everyone. But uh, I would still think that that's an amazing piece of technology. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about phones because I think that they're coming in really handy right now in this time of separation. So we'll get back to that. Especially you now. <laughs> William, how about you? Favorite piece of technology and favorite wine varietal? I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it in that order. Um, so technology, you know, I'm constantly amazed at the the progress and in, in the speed how of which things happen in the the Earth observation space meaning just everything from all platforms from from drones to satellite and how we are having more and more data of different data types at different temporal resolutions and and having the computing power to to deal with it only very recently and uh we'll start to see we'll start to look to to space platforms i think to answer a lot of questions for for us living every day on earth and combining that with with data that we can pull from the ground as well. For wine, yeah, the, like the other two said, it's a difficult question um, as wine lovers to put uh, one thing. Um, but I'll say is Syrah from the Rhone Valley, all the way from from Valais here in Switzerland to to the south of France. I I, I like seeing the difference uh, in the commonalities between that aspect. Awesome. The doc, how about you? Favorite tech other than your own? No. <laughs> favorite technology and favorite wine? Uh, just for the wine, I'm going to make a small apero after this webinar. So I will take, I will drink some nice uh, and fresh uh, Dole Blanche from Chamouzon. That will be perfect. It's a very uh, sunny today, so it's perfect. And regarding the technology, uh, for me, what really uh, helps me the more um, I think two things. The first one is the GPS because I, I'm really bad in orientation, so I really need uh, an help for my phone. So if I lost my phone, I'd be lost. So a GPS is really amazingly uh, efficient for me, and of course uh, also the the all the process to contact people uh, in my uh, daily basis work. So LinkedIn, that kind of platform, are really amazing to uh, reach people I, I need to talk to. So that's two points awesome yeah I, I have to say I'm the same with almost all the wine where it depends on mood and what you're what you're eating who you're with um, I am currently super in love with Riesling at the moment from uh, Reed Winery which is up in Healdsburg um, mostly because it's been really warm and it's you know easy and I can definitely afternoon weekend wine um, and technology for me um, I am the worst at spelling, so I am super in love with any kind of spell check, spell support. I know that that's, you know, robots in the background and artificial intelligence help me, helping me out, but um, I am a visual person. I am not good at spelling, so thank you for all spell check situation. <laughs> My favorite technology. Um, so, I mean, I know that, you know, obviously we're meeting virtually because of COVID and um, quarantines and all of these other kinds of things. So I do know we need to talk about that sort of first off. Um, so how are your companies sort of dealing with the economic sort of downturn closures that are happening right now? Um, and have you ever sort of seen anything in your businesses, whether it's, you know, here in Switzerland, where we've had to pivot quite so much um, for business, uh, whether it's with technology or with wine. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's sort of two things, at least for me, you know, on the, on the winemaking side, it's a little bit different. And, and the production side, uh, you just have to keep maintaining 
maintain social distancing, but we exempt in California. So COVID-19 uh, in the production because it's agricultural, we keep on we keep on going. But as, as far as the business is concerned, and I think Rene will be able to talk about that fairly fairly well. You know, the wineries are not able to to host anymore. Therefore, uh, you find other ways. And, and, and a lot of clients and wineries that I work with went digital quite a bit and, and recentered all of their staff and, and, and work, workforce, uh, you know, to contacting people via mail or phone and trying to generate sales. Uh, that, uh, the way it changed for me is I could learn more virtual blendings where people I used to go to wineries and uh, now people ship me the wine and we go on a, uh, any platform like Zoom and then I taste on my side, they taste that there and I give them the recommendation of blends, recommendations of blends that, that, that need to be done. Because for me, that's kind of, kind of how it, it went. Have you been seeing a big change in sales now that you're not able to sell at the actual wineries or is that... Actually, yeah, it depends. It depends a lot on on on, on wineries and programs, but uh, but uh, uh, you know, there's a there's a bunch. XR being one of them, Alfamea being another one that that really jumped fairly early, and they actually comp compensated fully. So they're selling as much wine virtually as they did when the tasting room were open. So they compensate that, and and it's really I think pushing to to ask ourselves: Is this something to stay and, and I think it is it's going to become another uh, you know revenue channel for businesses and for wineries from from, from, from Napa for sure uh, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll just see in addition to these revenue uh, progressively hopefully hospitality come back yeah I would say, I would yeah. say sorry go ahead no I was going to say staying on the wine front are you seeing, uh, the wine business sort of changing and you know have you ever had to sort of pivot like this before uh, well, this is a different world huh, we're in right now. Uh, obviously, uh, I think as, as uh, Jean mentioned, the, uh, the online sales are, are, I would say, even better than before. I think people are just uh, sitting at home. They have nothing else to do but to drink, I think, these days. So that's, uh, that's, the, good, uh, that's the good part. The bad part, I would say, is that uh, you know, we sell our wines a lot in restaurants. So that business has basically gone bye-bye, right? So... Um, retail, uh, we, don't, we don't do a lot of retail for, for Maryvale. We mostly, whatever we sell through the three tier system, as we call it, through the distributors, our importers is, is, really, uh, is really on premise. So in restaurants, hotels, country clubs, uh, that, you know, those type of establishments. Um, so a little retail. So of course that's difficult, but I would say, yeah, I mean, uh, online, we do uh, obviously virtual tastings, as uh, Jean just mentioned, uh, live live events through Facebook. Uh, you know, it's it's a little weird because uh, you don't have that personal contact that is so I think uh, the, the feel and touch of it that we have when when uh, you meet face to face or when we have customers visiting in our tasting room. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you do the best you can, and I think I, I agree. Also, I think it's gonna be it's gonna be a little bit the new normal. Uh, people are going to be a little bit gun shy to go back. I hear in Switzerland they just opened the restaurants again, and it's been uh, very even at 50% capacity, whatever the case may be. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, interesting to see how, you know, over time people will get probably a little more confident to to get in there. But uh, it also remains to be seen whether restaurants can operate at 50%. Some people decide to just not open because it's not yeah. worth it, right? Um, so that will take some time, I think, to come back. And of course, if we have a, a drug or a vaccine that's, uh, uh, you know, that, that we'll be able to use, then things will be a little bit different. But uh, I think you know, we'll continue to see, uh, you know, folks staying uh, also at home. You know, maybe they'll buy, uh, you know, a nice bottle of wine and uh, get some nice decanters, nice uh, stemware and, and uh, cook at home or, or you know, buy, uh, you know, buy the food to go. So yeah. I think it's going to be a slow, slow transition. On the, on the technology side, I mean, I know you guys aren't, you know, seeing consumers or customers face to face quite as much, but how are you seeing your businesses adjust sort of in this kind of economic time or, you know, how are you dealing with um, even just being able to meet with customers and, you know, demo things and, or are you already in that virtual space guys? William and uh, Yeah, well, 
No, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we, we had to uh, cancel some meeting for some demo with the uh, drones. Um, in any um, event, there is bad thing and good thing. And for us, the, the, the bad, of course, it we had delay on the de demo. Uh, the good point, good side was that we had to focus on R&D and we, could, we had uh, the chance to hire uh, people that were normally employed in uh, other uh, companies and we could uh, really go forward with the development and we have made huge progress in uh, two months, something that we may have been done uh, in maybe six months or that was really benefit, uh, a good benefit for, for us. Uh, the other point is that um, the border were closed for quite a, a two months period and it was unclear if uh, the people that uh, actually uh, make the spraying could come uh, to Switzerland and we had a lot of demand uh, to do treatment with the drone so that was also uh, something interesting to see that uh, we could replace uh, people that come from uh, other country from Portugal or, uh, or uh, Eastern countries. So that gives an idea that maybe next year, if we, have, if we are competitive uh, in terms of price, uh, quality of application, uh, we can have uh, quite a lot of business. Well, then how about yourself? You're definitely more on the data side and sort of... Um... Yeah, I mean, from, uh, there's two things. Like from the, from the commercial aspects, I mean, we're, we're used to meeting people digitally already. It does change some of our, our people on the ground in our key regions and how they can work. But I think of it more from our customer's point of view and particularly in agriculture. Um, I see if we take California as an example, there's, there was already a, a, a glut in the grape market and the prices were very low and a lot of things were being pulled out. And this will probably accelerate that quite significantly. So a lot of Grapes in California were thrown out last year and not sold, and it will most certainly be more this year. Um, and that means a lot of vineyards are going to come out. It's a good time to restructure your vineyard, put in capital improvements probably. But at the same time, it means farm revenues are down. Uh, the growers are at the bottom of the, the totem pole of the whole value added chain, and they're hurt probably the yeah. most. And, and we see that across different oh. crops, different regions of the world, different places. Um, often linked to, to, to what Rene mentioned about uh, the restaurants. The restaurants are such a big buyer of a certain, um, you know, if your wine brand's only selling to restaurants and you're a grower supplying those kind of boutique on-premise brands, uh, it's gonna fall down the, the line whether you're selling potatoes for french fries at mcdonald's or or grapes for for wine at restaurants cafe yeah. yeah i mean in california we're seeing a huge change in distribution of food in general um obviously a lot of the big factory farms are suffering the most and you know people are scrambling to find access to you know csas and smaller producers and buying direct uh to with the brands that they love most which i'm assuming that why the, the wines are doing so well because, you know, your existing customers are sort of reaching out and making sure that you're, uh, you know, staying open and you have the, the ease yeah. outside. Where of, brand loyalty will be strong, yeah. Exactly. You have the ease outside of, you know, other spirits where you can sell direct to consumer, which is uh, really great and sort of helping out in this time. Um, William, on your side, have you seen sort of a, a change at all in how your technology or how your data is being used um, right now in farming? Um, well, we don't know too much because the, the season isn't really in full swing for most of our crops, but in one of our key crops at Gamaya is in sugarcane in, uh, in Brazil. And this is being farmed year round. Um, and it's been a slow adaptation, so we are, we, I think it's been kind of the same curve. I'm not sure it's how it's too disrupted. Um, besides, of course, the, the commodity prices falling as well. And sugar cane is, is, is made for both sugar and, uh, and ethanol production. So it's linked to the 
it's an interesting industry because they have a switch and they can flip the switch and make sugar for food or sugar for cars. Um, but that means one half of the equation is linked to the price of oil, which of course also. Yeah. I know. That so, yeah. yeah. And I know that there are some, um, not so much winemakers, but other spirit companies and beer companies who are, you know, shifting production a little bit to make um, hand sanitizer and all kinds of other great things. So I think, you know, in winemaking and growing regions, you know, people are making those little shifts um, as well, just like clothing manufacturing is making masks. <laughs> um, Jadok, you sort of mentioned a little bit of a change with how you're seeing the drones being used um, right now, but how do you see, you know, technology sort of aiding in farming and sort of changing that process uh, right now, but then also, you know, in the next couple of years? So <clears throat> right now we have to prove that our system really works well and the projection uh, the, 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 yeah, the crop protection really works well. So um, we have been in test for one year, last year, and this year is really the first year we, we work uh, with a uh, winemaker, uh, one year to really prove that the system is really working perfectly and the quality of application uh, is good. The important point is that um, as we use a drone that are quite small, we have a very high precision on uh, uh, spraying the, the different type of uh, uh, liquid so it can be bio biological biodynamic or standard so that's really really important to have uh, we put less product uh, per square meter with a higher precision there is no drift and that's really important so um, we know that in the farming industry uh, especially in Switzerland things go quite slow so the people they need to know first if it works so they will ask uh, the neighbor you test it uh, does it work and then uh, you have uh, mouth to ear uh, and the uh, business will grow quite uh, fast so um, we already have some good experience last year but very small uh, surface we have we had treated something like a uh, four or five hectare and uh, this year we uh, will reach about 25 hectares and uh, that's really quite uh, encouraging and I know that next year will be really the big year because um, uh, as we think the result will be good, we'll have a lot of demand because um, we go much faster than by hand. Uh, there is no pain and uh, on the price also we are better. So we have all the, all the, uh, all the advantage in the hand to do something really nice. Yeah, I think also, you know, the use of drones, you know, in general, especially for spraying, you know, then people aren't carrying that, then they're not being exposed. Exactly. Uh, you know, to those chemicals, whether they're biodynamic or not. Um, so those kinds of things are sort of helping in, um, you know, how many people are needed on the farms, but then also that they could be doing, you know, more productive, you know, yeah. high touch. Uh, I can, yeah, I can tell you the, the first time we had made a demo, um, it was uh, at La Maison du Moulin uh, on La Côte, and uh, he was just amazed. He said, okay, I will never touch again uh, <laughs> something I have to wear on the, on the back and uh, uh, take a mask and everything. And uh, they really was amazed to see how simple it was and how efficient it was. So uh, this is really the best answer to, to show the machine, so uh, show how it works. And uh, yeah, people are really amazed. Yeah, for, whatever, for whatever it's worth, uh, just a, yeah. a note here, my uh, father-in-law and brother-in-law own a winery in Switzerland and they've gone from helicopter to, to uh, trying out to, to spray with, uh, with drones uh, this year. I don't know if, uh, Jodok, if it's with your company, but it may as well, may well be. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put a good word <laughs> in it uh, for you. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's more, you know, it's more precise, I guess. And uh, yeah, plus, and plus the, the, the capacity of reaction is, is so much better right after a rain. Hello, amazing. It's just amazing. It's a really good system. Yeah, it's more precise. Yeah, it's a helicopter. You have to plan when you spray with a helicopter. And in most of Europe, it's uh, forbidden. So uh, Switzerland is a bit of a special case. But right now, uh, the winemaker, they, they have uh, yeah, choice a bit in helicopter and uh, old technology. And the helicopter, you have to make a planning uh, six months before. And with the drone, you can really act extremely uh, quickly and change. Uh, we are more flexible also on the, on the, the schedule. Yeah, it's also less impact in the air and the sound and you know, less waste uh, from helicopter, which is great. 
Um, and I do know that drones are being used for more than just spraying, you know, especially on the marketing side, we're seeing beautiful photography being done um, of vineyards and farms. Um, we're also seeing, you know, heat mapping um, and data around, you know, mold and, um, you know, grape health. Um, are you guys, uh, the, both the winemakers and the tech, uh, technology side, are you seeing technology like drones, uh, robots, um, those sort of things, um, sort of helping with how we're dealing with environmental impacts, uh, fire, um, global warming in general, water shortage? How are you seeing technology being used to kind of aid us in that change? To dramatically, uh, to dramatical help in, in many of these fields. You know, technology helps, uh, and, and, and since we're focusing on the vineyard, let's focus on the outside and nature since we have, you know, these these uh, these wonderful William and Yodok and, and, and everybody that can talk about. But, but yeah, yeah, we do. We use more and more technology. I think in the wine industry, it started being the last 30 years was mainly chemical improvement, chemical knowledge improvement, especially on the winemaking side. And I think for the last 10, five, seven, 10 years, and the next 25 are gonna be outside driven, right? Farming driven, uh, climate mitigation driven, uh, uh, and, and, and we use quite, 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 a, quite a bit of technology from, from of course, uh, the, the, the drones and the NDVIs, which are kind of bigger picture to evapotranspiration, to, to microclimate sensors today where you can measure, you know, temperature differences and variation on a, on a meter, uh, you know, apart uh, to, to see the impact. Of course, you apply that and all these technologies are really uh, made, I think, for winemakers to be able to jump in to make a more educated decision faster. And in California, one of the big issues is, of course, water and the use of water. And, and a lot of people think very often, oh, the wine industry, you know, is a big water consumer. We're actually fairly small. Why? Mm -hmm. uh, we have a high product price uh, compared to many other crops. And therefore, we can invest technology like sap flow evapotranspiration sensors or, or many others, you know, uh, soil moisture probes that can help us regulate extremely precisely the use of water. And it's, it's much more in the, in, the, in the lower price point produce, uh, you know, that, that, that they still have, uh, you know, uh, the flooding irrigation and stuff like that. Today in the, in the wine world, you really can, you know, you, you, you can know exactly precisely how much the plant needs and at what time uh, to, to regulate that extremely precisely. William, are you seeing any big changes in requests of the kind of data that people are looking for or wanting to learn from? Uh, yes, I mean, the deeper people get into it, the more questions they have, and then they'll always ask, how can we visualize it this way? How can we do it this way? And I think, I think uh, it was exactly what was just said. I mean, wine, Wine's a particularly good, inter interesting crop and use case for, for mapping because already everybody is coming to it from a, from a geographical perspective. I mean, we talk about the wine from the country, from the region in the country, from the area, from the, from the vineyard, and then people talk about that's the best part of the vineyard. And so that's really what triggered my thinking of it early on in my career is saying, why is that the best part of the vineyard? And, and can you prove it? And can you quantify it? And can you, all these different things. And so of course, people have a hunch that is linked to reality, but is not one-to-one -one mapped. And, and this, is, this is where technology can help, not to, not to imply that it can do one-to-one, -one, but it removes the human biases in observation. It's, it doesn't revolve around memory. It doesn't revolve around uh, feelings and interpretation. Well, maybe still interpretation, but uh, it's, it's, it's a lot more pure and, and you can reproduce it. So having, having Everybody would agree that decisions should be driven by observation and having good observation uh, then should lead to good decisions. I think is the... Yeah, and if you can't see what's happening, then you can't make those great decisions. I, that, I mean, that's, that's, that, that's even the other thing. Yeah, of course, you have sensors for doing a lot of things that you cannot see. Okay. 
but even for things you can see, uh, you, you, you have, uh, you see the color green and you want to say, okay, this one's the darker green, the lighter green, and this says something about the, the vigorosity of the plant, but uh, you, you go green blind and you stop. If you talk to, if you talk to uh, turf professionals who work on golf courses or sports turf, they'll talk about green blindness where they stop, they be, and, and it's the same as, as, as winemakers losing their palate for the wines that they work on in their own cellar and why, and why you often involve outside tasters in your blending process is because you become a bit deaf or blind to the subtleties where you have overexposure. That's a good point. And, and, it's, and it's the same thing in your own vineyard. And when you're, if, you're, if you're walking your rows and you, 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 somebody who's there every day is going to pick up on the things that nobody else will. But they might also be blind to the, to the daily things that they've become uh, habituated by. Yeah. yeah. And that sort of brings up the point around just the idea of the romance of making wine in general, right? So, um, Renee, you come from a family of winemakers. Um, your, your, uh, your wife's parents have, you know, a winery in Switzerland, and you've been doing this for a long time. There's this... Um, in general, uh, a romance around winemaking, and it is very emotional and sensory and all of those things. I mean, are you seeing any, you know, for the winemakers, are you seeing any kind of downfalls or fears around technology in sort of taking that away from both the experience of producing it, but then also the experience of, of, of drinking the wine? Well, I think if we can use the technology, which uh, all of us do, and use it to our advantage, uh, why not? Maybe this industry has been a little bit slower than, than other industries, but I think we come to realize that, uh, look, if we can, uh, like we just discussed, if we can use, uh, you know, drones or aerial imaging for infrared uh, to, to irrigate your, your property more efficiently to find out about vigor, uh, uh, viruses, uh, and it goes on and on. We, for example, also use uh, spore traps in the vineyard. We've been able to eliminate the number of sprays we, uh, we do every year. Uh, so that's also good for the environment. Um, then you have a technology, of course, uh, mechanical pruning, hedging, leafing, harvesting, uh, also making, making progress. Maybe not at the, at the very high end. We're not uh, just there yet, but maybe we will be in 10, 15, 20 years, maybe before, I don't know. Uh, so I think as long as you can, uh, you can do it in a uh, sustainable, environmentally friendly way that, uh, you know, ultimately makes better wine, I think everybody wins. You know, I think uh, back in the days, you, we had big cell phones and, uh, uh, that were bulky and uh, that were heavy. And, <laughs> and, and nowadays, we're, we're not, you know, it's, it's gotten so much better. So I think we, we better jump on board. And I think we are. Uh, as I think Jean mentioned earlier, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's improving uh, uh, day in, day out. You have, uh, you can control the temperature of your tanks uh, from an iPhone now. From, you can be on the beach. No, I'm just kidding, but uh, you could probably be. Yeah. Uh, and also for frost protection, for that matter. So it's, there's many applications, uh, you know, be it in the vineyard uh, and uh, at, at the winery. So uh, then you can t talk about, yes, you talk about romance. Then I think it's maybe more at the finished product level, where you, whether you have a screw cap or maybe a, a cork finish, and I think both work just fine, depending on the application, depending on the product as well. Um, you know, this is, uh, I think, something people uh, have come to, uh, uh, to accept. I don't know how much the consumer knows about it, but we definitely, uh, definitely use it uh, to, to, uh, to our advantage. But I also, Rene, I don't know what you think about that, but I also think that, that there's, a, there's a, always a conflict between art and, and, and science. And, 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 and the day you start manufacturing, meaning reproducing an equation over and over, you remove the emotional side of things. And so I think wine is so related to emotion that it is very good that the end consumer doesn't know it all. Yeah, but I think they're not mutually exclusive, you know. Uh, I, think, I think as William said earlier, uh, maybe you're, it's gonna be also difficult. I think you use them side by side because it's gonna be difficult to replace your foreman that's uh, on your vineyard day in, day out. He knows a lot about, he knows more about the vineyard than, than anybody else. 
but if you can um, in addition to that you can complement that with the technology i think it's uh, it's the and, best of both worlds. And, and communicate it outside of where he might be talking with people on a regular basis mm -hmm. so I, when you can when you can broadcast that information what the vineyard is through the winemaking team from growers to winemakers grow relations and then that's what that's what the wine is marketed around as well so you can even have it go all the way the, the same observations can go all the way through i mean everybody says this is our reserve wine and it's coming from that parcel there on the hill and so you can you can paint that picture as well yeah i think it's a lot about education yeah and storytelling is a huge part of winemaking um, and I think things like the phone and virtual tastings and videos from drones and everything else, all of these things together allow us to tell a more complete story um, of the wine and of the brand or the farm, um, you know, from food all the way to, you know, animal products to wine. I mean, I think people really do want to know. They don't need to know or <laughs> most people don't care to know absolutely everything a lot of people still won't buy a whole chicken they want um their boneless skinless chicken breast but i think that there's um there is this level of care especially right now of like really knowing where things are coming from knowing that practices are being put in place um that are sustainable you know that people are being cared for and not um you know in bad working conditions so i think you know everything that you're all doing is sort of aiding in that transparency as well, which I think is uh, sort of a benefit of that technology. Um, so uh, just sort of one last question on my side, and then I, I have a couple audience questions that we'll um, bring up, but any big differences that you're sort of seeing between US winemakers and Swiss winemakers? I mean, Jadok, I mean, I know you are, you're there, William, you're there. Um, the rest of you have, you know, worked in both sides. Um, any really big differences that you're noticing? Anybody? I think, that, I mean, there's a ton, but in the context of winemaking and the business of it and everything yeah. is, is the complete opposite sides of the spectrum. I mean, um, what's one thing that comes to mind that's really different? I mean, you have the, uh, 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 well, Swiss winemaking is, is, is small family businesses or big businesses through, through networks of many, many growers. So you might have a winery that has a thousand member growers, each one with five to 10 parcels, meaning you're making wine from upwards of 10,000 parcels of grapes. So how you manage that complexity is, is just talk about grow relations or nobody in California deals with that level of complexity, even, even the, the Gallows and the Kendall Jacksons and the companies with uh, 500 SKUs. I think. Good point, yeah. And, and then, so, so a lot of the challenges are on the synchronization. And on the other side, then if you are, independent uh, vigneron, you're somebody who's, who's in the field on the tractor every day or have a small team and then also being responsible for the, the winemaking in the cellar and the commercialization, you're wearing three hats, um, which means you have less time for anything that doesn't affect you today and tomorrow. You don't have too much time about thinking about long-term future, and those that do will, will will slowly edge ahead in that game. I think, I think there's a big yeah, yeah. William. I think there's also a, another difference for me. Uh, you know, I would separate the differences this way. In a way, uh, first, certain differences are imposed by your climate and your soil, and that's how you react to your ultimate crop. But I also think that in in the U.S. Yes, and, and, and there's a big difference with Switzerland, and it's the marketing. Uh, I, I think that the position, the positioning of brands and, and wines in the U.S. and in Switzerland is dramatically different. And it starts with the fact that in the U.S., wine is still a luxury good, when in Switzerland, it's a daily consumption good. Uh, Absolutely. 
Yes, you have prices that are, you know, in, in bottle of wine that are more expensive than others, but it is not perceived as a luxury good uh, because of the history, because of the, the fact that people grew, grew up with these, these wines on their table at any given point in their, in their lifetime. In the U.S., you have a, a very big trophy wine uh, perspective very often, especially in the price points that Napa is because of the price of grapes uh, that, 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 that we have here. And I think that changes the angle, uh, the angle quite a bit on how people approach the industry, yes. and approach how to promote and position, position the brand. It's completely true. I mean, an uh, entry level Napa Red is going to be in the t very top your percentage of Swiss wines, price point wise. I mean, there's 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 not that many wines that are pushing above fifty francs, uh, much less in the triple digits. They're few and far between. So, Doug, anything on your side that you're seeing as a difference um, in farming techniques or adoption of technology? Yeah. Um, well, we have no experience yet in California, so it's really difficult for me to, to talk about it. Uh, but I think that. Uh, as said William, uh, as a business development, um, I have to contact many, many uh, winemakers in Switzerland to try to promote our technology and uh, to work to make crop protection. And uh, this uh, drive also on uh, how we make business. If you make a, you rent a service, you give a service, or you sell the machine. And in Switzerland, most of the people, they really need to buy a machine and, and the use uh, for themselves. Uh, I think in the U.S. maybe we have a service that will um, work for big uh, companies. So I, I think business business is really different in that uh, that kind of uh, idea. Awesome, Renee. Any differences that you're seeing between your um, production and your father-in-law? Yes. Yes, I can. Yeah, I think uh, William and Jean covered it pretty well. I mean, this is. Uh, it's a much newer industry here in this country and people are eager to learn though. So that's the great thing. And, and uh, you know, of course in Napa, we're uh, at the top of the, the pyramid, if you will, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, pricing, it's a small area. Um, it's about one eighth the size of Bordeaux, if you will. And, and of course known for, first and foremost for Cabernet and, and supply and demand at the end of the day, <laughs> it's very simple economics. and. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we, you know, Napa Valley is known to, to produce some of the, the greatest uh, cabs in the world with uh, consistently, I should say, there's many other parts of the world that can do that. But I think consistently, uh, obviously, Bordeaux and, and, and Tuscany uh, and Napa are probably the three places. Uh, maybe Jean or William, <laughs> you won't agree with me, but uh, I mean, I no, think no. Uh, you, you, you can produce some. Uh, some other, uh, you know, uh, great cabs in, in different parts of the world. I, I know that, but maybe just consistently. So, yeah, the marketing is quite different. Uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, no, you, you covered it. I don't need to repeat it. So I think it's, uh, it's pretty, much, uh, pretty much the fact. It's, it's part of the lifestyle. It has always been in, in, in Switzerland or France, Italy, Spain, you name it. Uh, here it's a much newer, uh, yeah, maybe luxury product, as you mentioned, Jim. So I'm going to read off a couple different um, questions that we got from the audience. People have sort of sent in their questions in advance, and I did try to sprinkle some of those in, but there's some really specific ones. Uh, one that came up multiple times is where do we actually find Swiss wine in the U.S.? Any uh, tips? And it is at, at there the Swiss consulate in San Francisco. <laughs> at the Swiss consulate, where else? My cellar. <laughs> where your cellar? In my cellar, yeah. <laughs> John, how about you, Arjun? Um, I, uh, I, I usually deal either with a straight shipping from Switzerland to me because I have an import license, or I use Swiss Seller, uh, which is a little guy, Laurent, is a little guy that imports a bunch of pastas and pinots and stuff like that on a, on a yearly basis that I got to know, and, 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 and I fill up my cellar that way, or I go to Renee's house to make sure that I have some good stuff. If I, if, I haven't, if I haven't consumed it all, but I think uh, people should know, I mean, 98% uh, of the Swiss wines are consumed in Switzerland. So you're not going to find a whole uh, heck of a lot uh, outside, uh, outside the country. And, and uh, oh, I uh, probably rightfully so, because we like our own juice, right? Yeah. And it sounds like Swiss Next needs to, um, the Swiss team needs to figure out uh, what retailers actually have it available. Post that for everybody. 
Um, to that same point, we had a couple questions asking about um, varietals which um, people should be looking for or things that, um, you know, are really excellent uh, in supplying. Is there, is there one or two varietals that are standouts to you that people should be looking for? Arvin. Which one? Petit Arvin. Okay. I agree. So, I mean, Switzerland has, has, has a number of varieties that are unique to, to the mountain valleys that are, if you're a wine geek, uh, that's, that's what you love. You want to find something that is, nobody can say they do it better, so you have it there. And so, uh, Rene mentioned uh, the best regions for Cabernet, but it's a lot easier to be the best region for Petit Tervin, and that's not a knock. Uh, to the growers here because it is great. But it's also, it's also nice to say that that's the top wine of the class. Um, and there's so many local, local varietals, there are also new varietals. I mean, Changin and, 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 and Védensville did really a lot of, of work. Yeah. Some, uh, you know, the Gamarez and the Garanoirs and the, and the stuff that you don't see and find elsewhere as reds or, or as, as, as William said, you know, these little specialties, historical specialties are really the Petit Arvin is absolutely mind-blowing, but you can think about Doral, you can think about yeah. different specialties. I think. I think that's a really good point, actually, because if we think about the sustainability and the future of viticulture uh, in the context of climate change, or even with the context of that climate change. Um, if you can breed a new variety that is resistant to disease and doesn't need spraying and make it taste good for, with wine, um, you solved a lot of sustainability issues. If you can make drought resistant varieties that don't need irrigation, you solve a lot of problems. And so, Actually, Switzerland is, is uh, in Shonjan, Agroscope in Shonjan is, is one of the leading institutions on that. And they collaborate with, um, with other breeding institutions all over the world, but also with a lot of the, the bigger companies will come to them and, and work on that. And those are long-term 20, 30 year projects to develop a new one. And, and there's been a couple of successful ones, uh, as, as, as Jean mentioned, uh, Gare Noir, Dolin, um, yeah, every region, every region is going to have its, its uh, has to find its, uh, its, its, you know, its varietal, its varietals based on the, you know, the, the terroir, as, as we would call yeah. it, you know, the yeah. soil, the climate. And the even if you can have, I mean, something that a lot of progressive growers I do see, they, they might have a marginal parcel that's north facing or semi north facing and have the highest disease pressure and not make the best wine anyway. So even if you have uh, one of these disease resistant new varietals that doesn't have the best uh, enological properties, still you can plant it with a disease resistant varietal, get rid of all your spreading, spraying, make a low maintenance block, and then have a blending stock um, that you can find a place for, uh, for your, the wine you want to make at the price point you want to make. You'll, you'll yeah, find a place so it seems for. like in general, as soon as we can, we all just need to go to Switzerland and try wine there, because that's going to be the easiest way to get the good stuff. Is that what you're saying? There we go. Okay. Good. I'm excited. I'm going. Okay. I, 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 did, I did mention the, the Swiss consulate, because I think officially they are the largest importer. Yeah, so we all need to go to events with the Swiss consulate. Um, <laughs> Another question uh, for Era 41's team, um, if there were any significant legal challenges um, to sort of starting your project? Yeah, sure. That's uh, something really important to, <clears throat> to talk about. Uh, in Switzerland, we have a huge chance to uh, have authorities that are really, really pushing for uh, new technology. So we have a lot of um, uh, accommodation. I, I mean, people are really, really pushing, the, the state are pushing um, for a new technology. So we have a lot of uh, possibly to make tests. Uh, the legal point of view in Switzerland is really, really uh, perfect. I know that in the US, it uh, might be possible to do that. We have started uh, some uh, work to uh, get uh, approval to make tests. Uh, it might take a little bit longer, uh, but it should uh, be okay. So, um, uh, but that's really something interesting in Switzerland. They really, really push uh, new technology. So that was something is really important and uh, even capital. So without this support, we could not do any tests. For example, if I take uh, France, it's a complete ban and it's extremely complex to do uh, just one demo flight. So uh, it's uh, 
a lot of papers and uh, bureaucracy, etc. In Switzerland, it really goes very fast, efficient, and that's really uh, something really nice. Awesome. It's, it's Switzerland after all. <laughs> Organization, I love it. Um, so one last question for the, the winemakers. Um, there were quite a few questions around organic and sort of any obstacles to switching to organic or regenerative winemaking processes. I know, you know, for a lot of small farms, it's very cost prohibitive to have that seal that says certified organic, even though they might be very, very organic for fully sustainable. Um, but any main obstacles you're seeing to, um, to that? I know taste is part of that. So. Yeah, but I think, I think, you know, it, it also, again, depends on where you are. I think it's much harder to be in Switzerland organic than it is to be Napa Valley organic. Because the really only thing that changes in Napa Valley is, is just your weed management, right? And so we made really big progress with certain machines now to mechanically remove weed. Uh, of course, the her these herbicides were kind of the, 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 the major boundary for, for, for vineyards to become organic, right? Because the biggest pressure here in, in Napa is, is mildew, uh, loyum in, 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 in Switzerland. And, 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 and so this is, you know, this is sprayed with, with mainly sulfur, uh, which is an organic, uh, you know, material anyway. So, so I, I think that it is our duty as farmers, our landowners in the case of, of René, uh, to progressively see and work towards uh, organic farming and regen regenerating uh, farming to make sure that we transfer to the next generation a soil, a vineyard, and a site that can last. And, and, and I think in a, in a climate as easy as Napa, uh, you, of course, it's a much younger industry, uh, you know, the wine industry is, and so it will take a little bit more time than it did in Germany and Switzerland, who have been pioneer of that field for many, many uh, decades. Uh, but, but I think we'll, we'll get there. And, and my hope is to actually have Napa make organic farm, farming mandatory down the line and, and 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 if you want the appellation and use the appellation you have to you know to, to, to use organic not so much for the marketing but just for the you know the the obligation that we have to to to, to transfer land to, to the next generation yeah i had a very fun uh, fact um, i posted a video on uh, on linkedin about uh, drones and they are spraying. And uh, I had a lot of comments saying, ah, oh, you are polluting, you are using chemistry. I say, no, that was organic. And people, they don't think that's organic. You have to work uh, and you have to make treatments. You have a lot of work. And I think there is a lot of uh, education to do to uh, show the people how hard it is to grow uh, wine. So that's something really, I was quite uh, shocked to see how many people say, oh, are, you are polluting, something like that. So um, the idea of the yeah, technology, robots and drones, is really to bring the cost down uh, with uh, automatization. This is uh, one of the key points for us. So um, that's the end of my questions. There are a couple other ones that we might post sort of in a wrap up um, that, you know, what grapes should I grow in my backyard and um, <laughs> do millennials drink less wine, all that great stuff. But um, any last final thoughts that we didn't get to that you each want to make sure that um, we leave our viewers with today? I think I think an interesting thing to that I, I regret not raising, not realizing in time when we had the, the pre meeting, is in the current state everybody is an expert in uh, epidemiology, and in grapevines we have lots of viral problems or that act the same way as, as coronavirus, whether it be red blotch or leaf roll or flavison store or et cetera, et cetera, Piercy's disease, where you have to, so I think there's, there's why well, I think there's interesting things to talk about on that subject about, uh, uh, these, these are the classes of, of diseases where there is no cure, the plant gets infected and it will either decline slowly or rapidly and eventually die, but it remains infectious. Uh, and it won't infect other things, but an insect will feed on it and spread to another one and then infect something else. So you need to socially isolate the diseased plants from the, the non-diseased plants, have you? And, um, and this, I think, going to the last subject brings some some interesting points because where in some regions where this is very bad 
there's no solution for the disease. Um, so the only, the best thing you can do is find the disease, kill the vine, and then replant it. But of course, control for that insect. Right. And what you do for, to control for the insect is mostly spraying, which means then you're forced to be not organic because there's, because the insecticide classes in, in, in approved biologicals are, are very few. Um, and then you have really difficult issues of uh, morality questions of saying, do you spray or not spray? Do you force somebody to spray? And if you don't, well, of course, the insects don't care about vineyard boundaries and they will go infect your neighbors or your regions or whatever else. And so these are, these are some of the same, uh, when we rethink the, the new normal for us post-COVID, um, these problems aren't going away in vineyards and they're accelerating as well. Renee, any last thoughts? Someone has to come out with a statement that uh, fine wine is, uh, is a cure for the corona. Um, no, look, I mean, I think, uh, you know, obviously viruses or so, uh, we figure, we figure 20, 25 years, you replant your vineyard here in California. Um, you know, of course, if, if the vineyard's healthy, then you, you continue. Uh, but that's certainly, uh, you know, the, certainly always in the back of your mind. You know, we had different, uh, you know, between the, the phylloxera and the, 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 the Achillean sharpshooter and red blotch and, and whatnot. So it's all, there's always something, um, you know, hopefully, you know, we can stay ahead of the curve, but... Uh, do you see that 20, 25 years as a reflection of like the cyclical grape market or just that these diseases are already priced in, in, in that calculation? Yeah, I think it's priced in that calculation. Uh, you know, I mean, we've, uh, knock on wood, we've been lucky on the, uh, the vineyard. You see the picture behind me was planted in the late, uh, late 90s. And, but we've had to replant a couple acres because of uh, because of some uh, some disease. Uh, we try yeah. to pull the vines as soon as we can. As soon as the virus, we pull them immediately. But of course, once it reaches a certain percentage of, percentage of the block, you uh, you, you better it, yeah. uh, you better rip the whole block of before it spreads uh, exponentially. So, uh, but uh, you know the rest of it is very healthy, and uh, we, we we keep going. Um, you know, obviously we have cycles in the industry, but I think it's it's more. Uh, it's more the fact that you, you know, when you, when you buy a vineyard, you should count on replanting it after 20, 25 years. Jadok, anything, last thoughts from, from you? Me? Yeah, you didn't get to say. <laughs> no, I really wanted to go to, uh, to California, so it's a really a pity. <laughs> and I hope you will, uh, will enjoy uh, soon some uh, flights and uh, come to say hi in real person. Yeah, I miss travel so much. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of the, uh, what do they say, the third space, you know, museums, coffee shops, bars and restaurants, um, and, you know, travel in general. So I am very much looking forward to getting out and about soon, but I really appreciate all of you joining me today uh, to kind of talk about this, and um, I will leave it to the Swiss Consul team to come back and say goodbye. Thank you, Deva. Thank you all for these interesting discussions. To everyone watching from home, I hope you're inspired by the potential of Swiss innovation. And I'll leave you with powerful images displaying the many applications of Swiss tech. Stay safe and see you soon. Bye-bye.